Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Jen Guzman, and I'm a doctoral candidate in clarinet performance. And today I'm presenting my lecture uh, entitled Examining the Portfolio Careers of uh, Classical Music Musician Entrepreneurs Through the Lens of Seven Clarinetists. A majority of 21st century classically trained clarinetists will not have the option of getting a full-time job in performance or academia. According to projections made by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, between 2016 and 2026, there will be a tough competition for jobs because of the large number of people who are interested in being musicians and singers, and there will likely be considerable competition for full-time positions. Additionally, according to data uh, compiled by the National Association of Schools of Music, NASM, in the HEADS report, Higher Education Arts Data Services, uh, in 2015 to 16, there were 33 clarinetists who graduated with a doctorate in clarinet performance, 132 master's graduates, and at the same time that year in the College Music Society um, postings, there were only nine full-time positions posted. So we can already see the odds are uh, not really in our favor. But we also have to remember that that was just one year, uh, one class of graduates from NASM, and there were previous years of clarinet graduates also vying for those nine positions. So the competition is fierce. Additionally, according to uh, the Strategic National Arts Alumni Project, SNAP survey, based at Indiana University, um, which is a survey that gets all arts alumni in all different kinds of um, industries, their feedback, a majority of them, you can see 73% felt that they gained little to no entrepreneurial skills while in school. And to bring it down a little narrower, um, at a large public university, a college of music, 71% of those students also felt that they gained little to no entrepreneurial skills. So we can see that the data suggests there's limited jobs, a lot of qualified people, and then there's um, a lack of entrepreneurship skills being offered to college level students, although that's starting to change with the development of music entrepreneurship programs all over the country, but there's still a gap there. So the proposed solution is portfolio careers. And a portfolio career is a combination of multiple part-time jobs to create full-time work. There's still a conversation around defining music entrepreneurship, but for this presentation and for my dissertation, um, we're defining it as a combination of the soft and hard skills needed to be prepared to create a portfolio career as a classical musician. So the purpose of this document, this presentation, is twofold. Um, to examine the best practices in creating and launching a portfolio career through the specific lens of these seven clarinetists that I've interviewed. And the second is to question if there's anything inherently differently about how clarinetists use music entrepreneurship to build their portfolio careers versus how classical musicians at large use the same resources. So my proposition is that with more guidance and awareness, clarinetists can create fulfilling, creatively fulfilling careers and financially sustainable careers instead of turning to non-music related work, which provides the financial stability but lacks sometimes lacks the creative fulfillment. So before we meet our clarinetists, I just want to talk about the literature that's already out there so that we can get a better idea of the conversation that's out there around music entrepreneurship. We'll start with some dissertations. And many of these documents have been written over the last couple of decades, especially in the 21st century, just because it is a more common and hot topic right now. Um, the first one that I'll talk about was written in 2018, and it was by Joseph Kaufman. And in it, um, he describes the perfect storm of challenges that affect 21st century musician. And those challenges, he says, are the outdated NASM uh, curriculum that schools of music use that don't include any kind of career development or music business courses, um, the large amounts of student debt that some of us take out to get our music degrees, and in combination with that, the dwindling market for jobs, as we've seen, the nine positions versus the over 160 graduates in that one year. Um, and he argues that higher education institutions can help fix this problem by requir requiring music business offerings um, 
to, to better prepare all those graduates coming in for the real world. The next document, we actually have the author in the room, Fabiana Claré. Um, she wrote a paper that also described music education, um, entrepreneurship education in higher education institutions, and also interviewed classical pianists and artist managers to see what they were doing to complement their careers in performance to get a, a feeling for what people are doing to be entrepreneurial and how they're making it in music. There are many other dissertations, two other that I've put up here, and the resource that I handed out is the bibliography from my paper, so there's a, a comprehensive list of other dissertations out there, um, just to paint the picture that it is a very active conversation that's happening right now. Next, we come to some online resources. The first two um, are blogs by Astrid Baumgartner and Angela Miles Beeching. Um, Baumgartner teaches at the Yale School of Music, and she has a history as a lawyer and the executive director of an arts organization and a career advisor. So she has a great background that um, definitely funnels into music entrepreneurship and helping young musicians find their way. So she has a blog, um, and Angela Miles Beeching also has a blog that covers similar topics, but because her background is different, um, they're both valuable resources. And Angela Miles Beeching is a, leading, a leader in the field of music entrepreneurship. She helped to start the program at the New England Conservatory and also started other music entrepreneurship programs around the country and has a book called Beyond Talent that we'll talk about in a little bit. And her blog is, comes out once a week and it's also very thorough and helpful and can be used by all classical musicians. The third one that I want to talk about is by iCadenza. So they have a free blog that's available to anyone, and it is a classical music focus, but they also have Coro by iCadenza, which um, you can purchase, and then you get to access micro courses, you know, 30 to 60 minute courses that were developed for classical musicians about specific topics to uh, fundraising, you know, um, building your website, writing a business plan, specific things to help people who don't know how to do these things get started and then and see the project through. So that's a really thorough and great resource. There are a lot of books to talk about. Um, I'm just going to start with a couple. The first is by David Cutler, and he is the director of entrepreneur, music entrepreneurship at the University of South Carolina. And he's the author of this book, The Savvy Musician, and he also wrote The Savvy Music Teacher. Um, in his experience, he also got a doctorate, you know, got his piano uh, performance degree, graduated and ended up back in his parents' house and didn't know what to do next. So from that experience, he has really figured it out from the ground level. And this book is a super comprehensive uh, resource that details how to fundraise, how to put on a concert, how to get your electronic press kit together. And it's written in a very conversational way um, that makes it easy to read. The next resource is by Angela Miles Beeching, who I mentioned earlier. And it's a similar resource they cover kind of a catch-all for classical musicians who are starting to build their careers, but it's written in a very different voice, and because of her different experiences, you know, she, she adds her own advice there as well. The next book is Music Marketing for the DIY Musician, and this book is great because at the end of each chapter, there's a worksheet that you complete, and by the end of the book, you have a marketing plan done and ready. Um, and it is geared more to towards popular musicians, but it directly translates to what we do as classical musicians. And, um, and it's written in a very conversational um, way, so it's very accessible and, and fun to read. And there, here's some pictures of some other books that are really great, and they're all on the, the resource that I handed out. Um, a lot of them are from that person's perspective. You know, they had a struggle and they were able to figure out on their own. So it's, it's um, very accessible and, and helpful. So there have been a lot of journals and articles written as well. Um, the two that I wanted to focus on were the journal, uh, International Journal of Music Business Research and then the Music Entertainment Industry and Educators Association Journal. Those two are, have some great resources, but there are also a handful of other journals and newsletters that cover music entrepreneurship topics, if not exclusively, then they do occasionally, like the International Clarinet Association Journal does have some uh, music entrepreneurship, music business topics covered, and as well as these other journals listed there.
So to get this project started, I selected seven clarinetists that I wanted to interview. And the way I chose them was that, first of all, um, they needed to not have a full-time job in performance or in academia. Not that those positions don't also include entrepreneurship, but I wanted to focus on somebody who is building portfolio, uh, portfolio career. Um, so then after I selected the seven people based on, those, uh, on, on that detail, I reached out to them and we had a one hour conversation where we spoke. Um, I'll show you the interview questions that I sent to them beforehand. And we had a conversation. We used the, the questions to guide the conversation. Some people went through and answered them very specifically. Others, we used it just uh, to guide the conversation. But after that one hour talk, I then followed up with each person, either with a 10 minute phone call or via email if that was easier for them to make sure that I had gotten everything correctly from them, and if they wanted to add or edit anything, that was the time to do so. Um, so the questions that I asked were, what is your definition of music entrepreneurship? Do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Have you ever considered switching paths to pay the bills? Do you have any mentors who taught you how to have a career in, and be entrepreneurial in music? Have your experiences with launching your own creative ventures made you more marketable for a traditional job in performance or academia? How did you fund your entrepreneurial activities? And what does the current or future scene of making it as a musician look like to you? And while there was some overlap, of course, they come from different walks of life, have different experiences. So it was really interesting to hear and compare all their answers to those questions. So these are the seven clarinetists that I interviewed. We have Zach Manzi. Michael Lowenstern, Annie Phillips, Sean Perrin, Michael McAfee, Claire Grelier, and Levine. And they all, the thing they have in common is that they all have portfolio careers, meaning they have multiple part-time jobs that create full-time and most, most of the time, more than full-time work. Um, and they're all uh, performing clarinetists. And if they're not currently performing, then they at one point were active. So <clears throat> the first person I want to talk about is Zach Manzi. So he's built an impressive portfolio career that includes, um, of course, performing and teaching, but also writing. He's a design thinking consultant. And um, he graduated from the Juilliard School in 2016. I actually knew him from my time there as an intern in arts administration. So it was really nice to reconnect. Um, after he went to the New World Symphony and played there for three seasons as a clarinetist. And currently, he's in residence at the Miami Frost School of Music uh, with his chamber group, Conduit, for a two-year residency. So I, I mentioned design thinking, and this is an area of Manzi's expertise. He des describes it as, quote, a way to come up with creative ideas to solve problems. So as an expert in this process, he's been hired by other arts organizations and LGBTQ organizations to come work with teams and to teach people about design thinking so that they can use the process to move forward, grow their organization, and come up with creative problem solving. He also was able, as you can see here, to give a talk about his experience with design thinking at a TEDx conference where he talked about his experience at New World um, when he got to use design thinking to create some unique concert experiences. Here he's pictured with his uh, duo partner from the chamber group Conduit, which is bass, clarinet, and clarinet and percussion. Um, and so he has a $180,000 grant from the Knight Fellowship Foundation for the two-year residency, which goes to support them as they build creative uh, programs and, and goes directly into the programs. So he credits this uh, a lot to how he stepped outside of his traditional role as a performer. When he was a fellow at the New World Symphony, he was expected to perform but he took it a step further and did extra musical things as well, which coincidentally, by doing things that were not performance based, he actually earned himself this fellowship where he's now being paid to perform. And so I thought that was really interesting um, there. So to build his own career, he's strategic about what skills and jobs he has and how they can cross relate. He thinks that, of course, at the root of everything is a high level of clarinet mastery. And he says, um, I quote, 
When I tell my students, what, when my students ask me what it takes to be successful, I tell them, you have to be the best musician you possibly can be. You have to be the best techni technician on your instrument you possibly can be. Everything has to originate from there. So our next clarinetist is Michael Lowenstern, which um, a lot of us know him as a, a really awesome bass clarinet player and from his very popular presence on YouTube through his channel Ear Spasm. Um, on that channel, he puts out videos on clarinet and bass clarinet pedagogy. He does candid, pro candid project, product reviews and also um, creates unique and sometimes silly music videos. Um, he's performed with and at the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center with the Klezmatics, Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, the Steve Reich Ensemble, and the New Jersey Symphony. Um, he's based in Brooklyn, New York. He's taught at Juilliard and NYU, and he currently teaches at the Manhattan School of Music. So while he was a graduate student, Lowenstern thought he was going to graduate and either get a job in an orchestra or as a college professor. Um, but soon after graduating, he realized that he wanted to forge his own path and also that he had to pay the bills. So he got a temp job in advertising, which for him, he's always been interested in advertising. And he talked to me on the phone about how he thought it was really interesting when he had his recitals, how he could create a poster that would get people to go to his recital versus the other three that were happening at the same time, which we've all experienced at UNT, such a big school, so much going on. So he was able to tie in something that he actually liked to do, was good at, and found something outside of music that created some fulfillment and also brought in that financial aspect that was lacking. So he um, also, around that time, he won the job with the New Jersey Symphony. And I have a quote here from him. I had one of those existential moments where I fast forwarded to the end of my life. And I'm thinking, all right, looking back at me now, am I going to miss playing more Beethoven? Or am I going to miss watching my kid grow up? And I was like, that's it. And I quit. I had another job offer from another big advertising agency that I took. And I have never played full-time music since. So that same year that he decided to forego doing the full-time music thing, he took that advertising job. And YouTube was founded in 2005. So he started actually building his presence out of necessity on YouTube. He was teaching some lessons. He would send his students off during the week and say, hey, listen to this rose tube that I've assigned. And they would come back and say that they listened to it, but that it was another high school playing, playing it on YouTube or something like that. So he decided, after every lesson, I'm going to record the etudes that I'm assigning so my students can find those recordings. So for multiple years, some of his videos had you know, 20, 30 views. And then when he started to use the YouTube analytics a little bit more to uh, target his audience. He was able to create the unique channel that we all know of today. Um, he realized that he had mostly teenage boys watching these videos, so that's when it took a turn to be a little more quirky, kind of silly, to engage that audience a little bit more. So he says here, when I look at YouTube data, it allows me to see a trend, and it allows me to look at that trend and ask why. And it allows me to hypothesize and make a change or not. So that part of advertising, which is very analytical, has helped me understand the audience and pivot when needed. And we have here a screenshot of his YouTube channel. Um, his most popular video at the, at the moment has over 513,000 views. So it's very popular. It's on circular breathing. It's a great video. So Lowenstern urges other clarinetists, if they're trying to find satisfying non-music related work, to figure out what skills they have and then see where those skills are needed in other jobs. He also understands the difficulty with making that switch and being open to getting work outside of the field of music. And he says here, I quote, when I started advertising, I didn't want to tell my friends, my music friends that I was doing advertising or my advertising colleagues that I did music. I kept them completely separate because there's a certain shame in selling out, and that's what I felt. So he doesn't feel that way anymore, but it's very common to feel that way at, at a younger age. So he's urging people to be open to, to seeking other creative jobs. So in addition to all that he does, he also um, has an online woodwind accessory shop, if some of you have seen on his website. He does residencies at other colleges. He does freelance gigs. He gets royalties on the music he writes and he owns an Airbnb. 
So he says, uh, once he stopped becoming a full, once he stopped being a full-time musician, he became a better musician, more successful, more influential, and much happier. And you don't have to make music. To, you don't have to make a living in music to be a musician at the highest level. It is not one or the other. Music is for a lifetime and has nothing to do with your career. So our next clarinetist is Annie Phillips, and she is the Associate Dean of the Entrepreneurial Musicianship Program at the New England Conservatory. Um, before that, she was based in San Francisco and had a very popular um, new music group where she was a performer and did arts administration. She also um, worked for the San Francisco Symphony in PR and is the co-director of Switchboard Music Festival, which is based in San Francisco. So she's very active. Um, while a student at the Peabody Conservatory, she had other jobs, just like many of the other clarinets here who did things outside of the field of music just to keep some revenue coming in. So she worked at a waitress, she worked at Clark Phobes mouthpiece store, um, and the symphony, as I mentioned. And one summer she did a tour with her chamber ensemble at different colleges by using her network to set that tour up. So, she now is the dean at, the, at NEC for uh, entrepreneurial musicianship. And I have a quote here pertaining to her transition. I was thinking a lot about what is my purpose and what am I good at and what is my mission? I looked back at all the work I had done and a lot of the work I had done in music was about building the future of music, building on existing structures in order to make it so that more people have relationships with music. When I was really young, I wanted to be a music teacher which to me was all about the younger generation getting excited about playing in band. And then it became, I want to work in an education department at a symphony. So I designed a couple of education projects. And then I was working in publicity. So all of what I do is with the goal of building a place for music in the future and making sure that it stays in, as an integral part of our society. Then I looked at what I was doing here and where I had the largest capacity to do that. I thought, well, I'm doing this work as a clarinet player. My Chamber group is pretty well known, and we're pretty well known in the Bay Area for what we're doing. I basically decided that as an individual, I had more capacity for change in leadership. So because she was able to identify the core things about what she loved about her activities in music, she made a career pivot that resonated with her, and now she's in this amazing role. So she also shared a little bit about that role and how she works with students who are in the same position as us, trying to figure out what to do after graduation. Um, and she notes that it's, you know, music entrepreneurship is still trying to get its definition down because there's, so it's not as solid as some other things out there. It's different for each person. Everybody comes from a different background, has different skills, has different goals. And so we can't, there's not one size fits all. So she talked a little bit about that. Um, but she did say that she noticed that our generation of, of musicians is often looking at music through the lens of social change. So a lot of the projects that people are putting together, something to do with bettering their community or bettering society, which she sees as a positive change. Um, and she also said, just as a note, her job wasn't even a thing when she graduated from college. So, so much is changing. We don't know what our options will be even in 10 years. Um, and she sees right now as a very exciting time to be a musician, you know, where some people feel kind of uh, pessimistic about it, like all the, the data I said at first about no jobs, a lot of us qualified musicians. Um, she sees it as a time where people are, are finding their own place within the musical ecosystem. So there's a place for everybody as long as you can identify your, your core skills and values. And it's kind of an exciting thing. So she says here, everyone is finding their place within the mu musical ecosystem, whether it's in a way that already exists or by building something new. So the next uh, interviewee was Sean Perrin, and he's based in Alberta, Canada, and he is the creator of the Clary Neat podcast. And um, he also works for Bakun Musical Services, and he teaches at the Mount Royal University, teaches clarinet, and he is a freelance performer as well. So while he has, he has also had a lot of positions outside of the field of music, either during school or right after to pay the bills, um, but one job in particular is, it really shaped his future. Um, he worked at a hail insurance company where he was, um, you know, preparing cars for the work that would be done 
for people who had hail damage. And so he had a lot of time in that position to listen to podcasts. So the first summer that he did that, he was listening and, you know, always looking for a clarinet podcast. Couldn't quite find what he wanted, but, you know, it wasn't there, so he listened to other stuff. And then when he came back to that job, that uh, job at the hail insurance claim company, he realized that he was still searching for the same thing. So he thought, you know what, there's a need. I, I would really like this. I want to do it. I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to give it a shot. And that's how he started the Clarinet podcast. Um, so he talks about his experience with his early, earlier episodes when he first started recording. And I'll give a quote here. Some of the earlier episodes are, for me, really quite embarrassing. It just sounds like me whispering in my basement on the phone. That's kind of all it was. There was nobody else listening. And I wasn't really sure of the things I was doing. I didn't know how to interview. I didn't know how to produce a podcast. I thought I knew, and I wanted to. But if I had known all that I didn't know, I probably wouldn't have started. Looking back, I really learned a lot. But I think it was an important journey I went on. You can't start something on day one and expect to be as good as you will be five years later. So uh, Sean Perrin and I talked about how it's important to say yes to opportunities, but he also gave me something else to think about, that while it's important to say yes, it's also important at some point to start saying no to the things that don't resonate with your uh, path or what you're interested in or what's giving you um, fulfillment. So he picked this trick up on another podcast but he says it's a good filter to uh, put opportunities through. So the questions are, as you can see, will it pay? Will it advance my career? And will I enjoy it? So if you say yes to all three of those, then it's probably a great opportunity to accept. Two, if you say yes to two, that may be also a good idea. But if you're only saying yes to one, then maybe that's the time to pass it on to a colleague and, and choose something that is with your career path. Um, Perrin also noted that of course, he wants an interesting career, and he always had has, but he also wanted normal things in life, like a family and a car. And so by making the decisions he's made, finding his own place within the musical ecosystem, he's been able to create that life for himself. Our next clarinetist is Michael McAfee, who's a founding and performing member of Eighth Blackbird. And he actually started that group with his friends and colleagues in 1996 as six um, And today the group has won Grammy Awards and they perform all over the world in the country at different colleges and residencies and at concerts. Um, and they also recently launched the Blackbird Creative Lab, a summer workshop. In addition to his role at 8th Blackbird, he also teaches um, in Virginia at a college and does freelance web development. So McAfee and his colleagues in the ensemble have all worked outside of the ensemble throughout the years as well. Um, he says that what was different about their group, he believes, is that they all made a commitment to, to the group. That was their first priority. And any other jobs they had outside of that or opportunities, they fit around their eighth Blackbird schedule. And he says often young groups who are trying to start chamber groups um, do it the opposite way, and they end up falling apart because you have to, you know, everybody gets so busy with schedules and workloads that they, the commitment they had really made a difference for them. And he also says that the jobs that they all did outside of 8th Blackbird actually informed them in their creative process, and they were able to draw on different inspirational, um, different inspirations from their other jobs and not get stagnant. So he actually credits a lot of that to having jobs outside of their ensemble. Um, and they also tried to, you know, in the early years, they were doing both the performance and all of the administrative roles, which is often how it is for uh, music startups until you can afford to hire somebody to take over that if you wish. Um, so they were really purposeful about that and either tried to use someone's skills in the right way so that they were being taken advantage of, uh, the skills were being taken advantage of, or if somebody said, hey, I really want to learn how to do this better, let me try it out. The group also supported that. So they really helped each other grow as people. Um, so while they gathered business skills over the years, they didn't have that from the very start, they have always been very entrepreneurial, um, especially in 1996, the programs they were doing were entrepreneurial, but still today they're innovative. Um, and I think that's 
we, we had the opportunity to hear them perform here, and they were amazing. Um, so McAfee also talks about maintaining your motivation in your career, which kind of goes back to the last point I made about finding inspiration in the other roles in other parts of your life so that your music making doesn't get stagnant. Um, he also says that, quote, nothing will burn you out faster than letting yourself be on 24 hours a day. So whatever you have figured out for yourself or figuring that out, whatever that is that you do to charge, recharge your batteries is very important to the creative uh, process so that you can avoid that burnout. He also thinks that being a diligent, hard worker, of course, is very important in this field, which we all know. Um, but that being flexible is super important. And here's a quote from him. Let me go back. There's an inordinate amount of guilt attached to what we perceive as failing in our career as an artist. Being a, being a successful professional musician never, ever meant that you have to make 100% of your income from music at all. But for some reason, we are taught from an early age, either through verbal or nonverbal means, that if 100% of your focus and energy is not coming from your instrument, then you are not dedicated and you are a failure. And that could not be farther from the truth. I think that sort of mentality is what really breaks a lot of incredibly talented musicians. Claire Grelier is a full-time doctoral student at School of Music in Clarinet Performance. And um, she is also a founding and performing member of Four Play Clarinet Quartet. Um, she grew up in France, but moved to Cal California to, to do her undergraduate and graduate degrees. Um, and while she was at Cal State Fullerton, she and some of her friends started playing uh, popular music together in a clarinet quartet setting. And she said the reason was because she, she would go out into the real world where non-musicians were and try to talk about clarinet and people didn't even know what the instrument was. And she found that very frustrating that she was dedicating, you know, how many ever hours a day practicing and getting degrees in this instrument that the general public knew nothing about. So she saw an opportunity and her colleagues, they saw an opportunity to draw, draw some dots between clarinet and popular music and um, the general public to create some more awareness. And also to use as a tool with younger students who sometimes feel disconnected from classical music and they wanted to be able to, to get them hooked uh, a little bit sooner. So um, the ensemble has over 22,000 subscribers and over 2 million views on YouTube. So they've reached a lot of people. Um, in addition to freelance performing and teaching clarinet lessons, she's also done other jobs. Like uh, she's a French, has been a French tutor, a nanny, and she's worked at Whole Foods. Um, but she's made it a priority to try to go to school where she can not have to take out loans and just be frugal in that way. But she also has a background in business, so she knows that she can... Um, and, and she's at Miami Frost where they have a great music entrepreneurship uh, program. So she knows, she feels very confident that she'll be fine after graduating. Um, so these are the current, four current members of the Four Play Clarinet Quartet. Um, there was one member that was original but is no longer in the group. Um, but as I said, they started playing to draw that connection from the, the classical music world to the general public. And now they have a huge following. Um, and she says that when they first started, they didn't really think about the money, even though now they are getting some revenue from YouTube and some support as buffet artists. Um, but at first, it was just they would, uh, friends would donate their services. For example, the videographer who made their first vi music video donated that. But as, just as Sean Perrin learned through doing, they now know how to make their own music videos. And so they don't have to. Uh, hire out all the time, but if they do hire out, they're able to pay now because they're making a little more money. So Levana Cohen, she's a freelance clarinetist based in Long Island, New York and in New York City. Um, she teaches clarinet at Long Island University CW Post and Suffolk County Community College. And she also manages her own private teaching studio She's the principal clarinetist with the Astoria Symphony and the founder and director of the Port Washington Clarinet uh, Choir. And she's a Van Doren artist, and you can see some of her pedagogical articles on their website. So um, when, when she graduated with her doctorate, she had worked in retail and kind of tired, uh, very tiring jobs. She made a decision that she was going to set herself up 
for success in the way that she didn't want to be drained at the end of every workday and not have energy to give to her clarinet. So she, she decided to find work that was music related so that she could keep her clarinet uh, skills in shape. Um, so she advises, just as Lowenstern did, for people to find jobs that are not too energy depleting so that you still have that time to give to your instrument. So she believes in creating your own venues. So if you don't have an opportunity for yourself, then you can go out and make it happen. Um, she, as I mentioned, she created the Port Washington Clarinet Choir. She also, after graduation, started the North Shore Chamber Music Society, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was a project she had started after getting her doctorate. Um, <clears throat> so she also noted the importance of realizing how much administrative work goes hand in hand with being a freelance clarinetist and musician. Um, she does all the social media networking and marketing. She updates her website. She designs flyers. Um, she keeps her records organized on Google Drive. And she has memberships to professional uh, organizations. So she's starting to be able to hire a little bit of that out. But it's important to realize, even if you're a freelance performer, you are still doing a lot of uh, administrative work. So just to, be, to have some entrepreneurial skills is going to come in handy, even if you're trying to perform full time. So she really uh, talked a lot about how important it is to create an environment for yourself that leads to uh, support and success. So just as when you're in an ensemble playing with people who are better than you, they kind of raise you up to their level and you, you can play a little better. Um, she says that same thing just about your, your support network. So surround yourself with people who support you, who uplift you, who are kind. Um, you know, she says here that, you know, make the choice, choose your path, your colleagues, your friends, create this really supportive, positive atmosphere for yourself, a kind atmosphere. Music making should be joyful. We're creating beauty in the world. It's so easy to get jaded and bogged down, but we have to let the light shine through. So those are all of our clarinetists that I interviewed. And now we're on to the point where we're going to kind of look at it as a big picture, summarize some things. Um, and just I want to go back to the purpose, which, as you can see here, my purpose when I set out to write this document and prepare this presentation was to examine the best practices in creating and sustaining a portfolio career through the lens of these seven clarinetists. And also to question if there's anything inherently different about how clarinetists use music entrepreneurship versus how classical musicians at large use it. Um, based on these interviews, I did not find a difference between how clarinetists use music entrepreneurship resources, but I do still strongly believe that resources that have this specific focus are very important because it's very helpful to see someone like you doing what you want to do so that you can have direct examples of what your options are. Um, but of course, we should be learning from people in our field, in our, with our instrument, other artists, other non-artists. We should be looking at all people for, as examples of how to build our career. Um, but if you want to see some, if, some examples of what their answers were and compare those answers, that is on the table that I handed out um, the answers to all those seven questions. Okay, so the best practices that I, I honed the interviews down into were turn ideas into actions, even if the idea is still in the prototype stage. Build and utilize a network of supportive people. Say yes to opportunities. And find creative work outside the field of music that provides fulfillment and also inspires and rejuvenates your creative music making process. Okay, so as musicians, we all know that it's, uh, we must perform to practice. We can't just practice in our, in our secret practice room or in a lesson with our teacher. We actually have to get up there and do it to, to learn that process. So in the same way um, that we have to play in master classes, that we do mock auditions, that we have juries, um, we need to do that with our other creative projects that are either music related or not. But even if we don't feel totally ready, we have to trust the preparation that we put in and know that we have to put the idea out there to get some feedback from real people in order to improve it. 
So Manzi talks about this a lot, um, and here's a quote from him. I was really afraid of, of everything I did. I was thinking, I don't know what people are going to think of this. Sometimes people have described me as being entrepreneurial, and the implication is that I'll just put my work out there without reservation, but that's not really true. Sometimes I have a lot of reservations about putting my work out there, but the risk of keeping all that in and taking a more traditional route where I don't have to come outside of my shell as a musician is, much, is a much higher risk to me than the risk of putting myself out there and failing. For Lowenstern, as I mentioned at the start of his YouTube career, he had videos with just 20 to 30 views for multiple years. But he had to put something out there in order to get to where he is today with hundreds of thousands of views and, and uh, thousands of followers. Same with Perrin. Before he knew even how to record a podcast, he started because he had an idea and he needed to do it to actually learn a little bit more about the process. Claire Grillier with the clarinet quartet didn't know how to produce or record the videos. They weren't, you know, didn't have a whole library of transcriptions or anything. They just started doing it for fun and learned through that process. So the big takeaway is just put your ideas out there so that you can get some feedback. And then, of course, you're taking it back as a prototype. You're taking it back, making improvements, and always uh, putting it back out for even more feedback. So another common thread, the next best practice, was to build and utilize a network of successful and supportive people. This is, um, of course, we've all experienced this and understand it to be true. But for example, with uh, Levana Cohen with the Port Washington Clarinet Choir, she was able to use the network of people she knew in New York to build that choir, but then she used it as a tool to also expand her network by bringing in guest, uh, guest clarinetists to do master classes and to perform with them. McAfee noted um, with his experience with Eighth Blackbird, when they hired, when they became a nonprofit and hired a board of directors, they were able to then use the skills of all those board members who come from different areas and different industries to be able to then improve their own personal business skills. So the, the performing members got some mentorship from those board members and used their network in that way to, to better themselves and their skills. So it's important to say yes to opportunities. Um, for example, with Zach Manzi, when he said yes to opportunities at New World to go step out of his traditional role as a student and to do some interesting concert uh, with design, design thinking in mind, he was able to then go to a TEDx conference and speak. And he was recruited by Coro to do a micro course that now lots of musicians have access to. Um, and as I said before, it's important to remember not only to say yes, but to be saying yes to things that align with your, um, your values and your skills and what you want your trajectory, career trajectory to look like. So you can always call on the triangle that Perrin mentioned. The questions are, will it advance my career? Will it pay? And will I enjoy it? So we can use that to be, while saying yes, still being selective about what we, what we do say yes to. So this fourth one, um, to find creative work outside the field of music that provides fulfillment and boosts creativity in the music making process. Um, so often we think we want to, as young kids, we say, I want to perform full time or you know, even later in life, we want to perform full time. Um, and I think that actually, I don't know anybody who just performs full time. Everybody's doing something else, even if their main role is performance. So how can you find work outside of that that actually makes your time with your clarinet more enjoyable, more inspirational, and, and better experience overall, and more long-lasting so that you don't burn out sooner in your career than you wish to? Um, and this goes perfectly with what Annie Phillips talked about, where she made the decision to change into leadership because this is what inspired her in, within the music world. And she was able to identify that and, and make that change. So whether or not one secures paid work in the field other than music, it's important to note that a majority of the interviewed clarinetists felt that they spent time away from music. The time they spent away from music often offered an opportunity to become refreshed and to bring more creativity and inspiration into their music when they actually did engage. And it's important to keep to keep in mind the dedication and flexibility that are required to building one's career. 
And um, that, of course, the foundation always comes from clarinet mas mastery, so we can't get away from those hours in the practice room. This is to supplement that and to enhance the opportunities available to you once you um, do hone your instrument in that way. So just to recap a little bit, um, as we saw in the beginning, we know that current data suggests that the number of qualified classically trained clarinetists outweighs by a lot the number of available full-time uh, traditional jobs in performance or in academia. But comparing those two numbers, seeing that ratio, it does not need to be a hindrance to your career. It can actually be something that we're aware of and we work with. Um, and by using understanding portfolio careers and, and knowing about music entrepreneurship skills, we can actually use that to find our very own place in the musical ecosystem. And I believe that everybody does have that place available to them. So um, <clears throat> the seven clarinetists built very different portfolio careers. Um, and the, the vast array of their opportunities led them, uh, they were able to let go of the stereotypical definition of what success in music looks like, and they were uh, adapted it to their own personal uh, needs and beliefs. So collectively, I have a little career tree here. Um, the interviewed clarinetist did all of these things, uh, work in performance, education, arts administration, writing, public speaking, web development, advertising. You can see the whole list here. So while this doesn't reflect every op opportunity obviously available to us, it does show a wide range of things that are available to us and that real people are out there doing right now. So I, just to put my own experience into it a little bit, what I realized in doing these interviews and through my own experience with clarinet performance and music entrepreneurship, um, I just saw this overarching theme of thinking about the big picture idea while keeping the small details in place and doing that by using the SMART acronym, SMART goals, which I'll talk about, and also by uh, implementing a routine. So we've all learned in lessons and as musicians that you have to think about both the big picture and the small details. So when you put a recital together, you're thinking about the, the whole experience as one. You're thinking about each piece. You're thinking about each movement. And then from there, you go down even further to measures and notes. Um, so we get really good at being able to see things in that way, which is a skill that not everybody has. Um, so being able to have that skill is an asset when you translate it over to doing something outside of music or in business, you get to you know, have that creative big vision picture, but you also have the skills to break things down into manageable steps. And this is where SMART goals comes in. So SMART is an acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. And it's, um, it's a way to help us overcome our human nature Sometimes we have great intentions of accomplishing things and reaching certain goals, but you know we get too busy or it falls to the wayside or the, the long-term project gets lost amidst the day-to-day the -day activities. So by making a goal smart, you know, specific, put it, you know, timely, putting a due date to it, we actually help hold ourselves more accountable. So what I have up here is from my last recital when I was preparing the Nielsen Clarinet Concerto, and I actually cut with scissors and pasted with glue all the hard excerpts um, from the piece, and then below you can see I mapped out, it's a little bit blurry, but I mapped out the dates, you know, a week apart, and then the tempo goals that I had for each excerpt. So a piece that can be very overwhelming, seen in this smaller booklet, you know, extracting all these hard parts and then seeing the map to my recital date, and actually I had a couple weeks at the end where I could just, you know, make it better at that final tempo. It actually, it made it feel much more attainable, and it really did work. So you can apply this to to business as well, just putting, putting a specific number to things, you know, your goal and making it timely. The final thing, we all know this as musicians too, you can't practice the night before and be ready for a performance. Um, so routine is super important in both music and business. Uh, we've all had the experience or had a student who tries to study the night before or practice the day before and it just doesn't work. So we need to make sure that we're putting in that time. Even as I was writing this dissertation, there's a book called Write Your Dissertation in 15 Minutes a Day. And I, I never read it, but I did keep the title in mind because um, sometimes I knew I just wanted to sit down 
for three hours and get a lot of work done, but I only had 20 minutes. So was I going to use that 20 minutes or was I just going to wait till I had a three hour chunk? And I think it's important to take those 20 minute time chunks to get stuff done, even if you don't have that bigger chunk that you really want. So through the conversations that I've had with these clarinetists and what you've learned today, we can see that there's a lot of different definitions of music entrepreneurship and that it's still uh, being defined. So Manzi's definition was creating your own opportunities. Annie said, uh, Annie Phillips, moving resources up the value chain. Specifically what that is is different for each person. Perrin thought it was creating a music business that is scalable. McAfee wrote, being able to communicate in a compelling way to musicians and non-musicians and knowing where your product fits into the broader arts market. It's thinking out of the box. It's having creative musical ideas and enough determination to make those ideas happen. It's creating your own venue. And while the, while the absence of a clear definition of music entrepreneurship may be what holds it back as an academic field and while it's still finding its place in academia, it doesn't need to be a hindrance to us, to individuals who want to become more entrepreneurial. And um, in addition to us, our generation, 21st century musicians being entrepreneurial, it's actually seen throughout our whole history of musicians back uh, centuries ago. So I just wanted to end with Michael Lowenstern's definition um, that it's a way of life, it's the spirit of invention, and it's up to us how we do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.